I recently built this plastic biovore using the parts from the Tyranid Tyrant Guard Kit, and as I was painting for that conversion guide, I thought that I would share with you the steps that I used to paint the biovore. Now, if you've seen my Asriel conversion, then you'll be pleased to hear that a number of these techniques were also used on that model too. So, let's get started. After building the model, I began with a dark grey primer that was created from a mixture of Vallejo's black and grey surface primers. Priming is always that important first step. It helps to give you a uniform starting colour regardless of the materials you've built your model from, as well as giving you a better surface for your layers of paint to properly adhere to. The dark grey colour was picked because the theme I was looking to recreate was a darker version of High Fleet Kraken's red and tan colours. This dark primer would allow me to retain the dark shadows in the recessed areas, helping them to contrast nicely against the brighter edge highlights. I had chosen dark grey over black just to allow for slightly easier coverage over the first couple of slightly lighter base coats. Additionally, I applied this with my airbrush, but this was just for convenience and you can use whatever priming method that you have to hand. So we're going to start out with a quick bit of colour theory. If you look at a colour wheel, you will see that some colours sit opposite others. The pairs of the colours are known as complementary or contrasting colours. Essentially, they appear more intense when they are next to each other. We can take advantage of this concept to help create darker looking shadows by painting these shadows in a colour that contrasts against the intended colour of the area. In my case, this was the red carapace of the Biovore. As green sits opposite to red, I began my base coat with some of Vallejo's German Camo Dark Green. I thinned this out a little on my wet palette to allow the paint to spread a little easier and then painted all the areas of the carapace that were on the model. I allowed the first layer to dry and then applied a second, giving me a solid dark green base colour. Continuing with the base colours, I next needed a colour to contrast against the light tan. Now tan has elements of green and yellow, so I needed something that would work well against both of these. As blue and red work together against yellow and green respectively, I chose to mix the two together to create a deep dark purple. To create this, I added some dark Prussian blue to some gory red. Like before, I mixed in a little water to my paint to make it easier to apply and then covered the remaining areas of the model, applying a second coat once the first had been allowed to dry. Following this second base coat, I was left with a slightly unusually coloured miniature, but I would be starting to apply a more familiar colour scheme in the next step. To create the first coat of red, I wanted an intermediary colour that would work to help blend the dark green into the dark red, so I simply mixed the two together. I added some of the original German camo dark green to some gory red to create a very dark red colour. This was thinned out a little more than with my base coat and then this layer was applied over the carapace. With this thin coat, I avoided the deepest recesses, retaining the darker green colour within them. Like before, I allowed the first layer to dry before applying the second, resulting in a deep red colour over the armour plates. Using some pure gory red mixed with just a little water to thin it out, I set about building up the gradients. I picked a few key areas of the armour that would appear as a brighter red, such as across the shoulders, the centre of the leg plate and the top of the armour surrounding the cannon. I painted this red colour in thin layers, covering around half of the plate surface with my first pass and leaving the recesses alone once again. I left it to dry and then applied the same mixture again but covered a slightly smaller area than I did before. This layering technique not only helped to build up the brightness of the red, but also created a smoother transition from the lighter, more central or upper parts of the carapace to the darker, recessed areas. This technique was repeated with the brighter red of Blood Red. I thinned it out and applied several layers, with each layer covering a progressively smaller area than before. In addition to this layering process, I also added some slight stippling and used the brush in a more horizontal motion. As this paint was much brighter than the previously used paints, it helped to add a little texture to the carapace's surface and prevented it from looking perfectly smooth and unblemished. These horizontal lines were also added to the edges of the carapace's section. When applied over the deep dark red, it resulted in a slightly fractured and rough looking edge. The final layer was hot orange. This covered the smallest area of all the layers that I had so far applied, and so was mainly limited to just the shoulders and the top of the weapon. 
Like before, I continue the horizontal movement and slight stippling motion in order to add that texture. The carapace had a number of hard corners, so to really help them to stand out and to give them a sharpness, I added a small dot of bronze flesh tone to each of them. This pale orange color continued the dark red to the orange gradient achieved in the previous steps, but its paleness really helped to emphasize these points and give them a sharper appearance. Now that the final highlight to the carapace was completed, it meant that I could move on to the rest of the model. To recreate the tan coloration of High Fleet Kraken, while still keeping that darker, higher contrast appearance, I chose to mix some dark Prussian blue and gory red together once more, recreating that dark purple that I had previously applied. To this, I added some of the medium brown of Flat Earth to create a dark brown that sat somewhere between the dark purple base coat and the pure Flat Earth that I will be applying in the next step. This paint was thinned and applied in an identical manner to the way that I tackled the carapace. I applied thin layers, reducing the area that they covered each time and leaving the purple visible in the deepest recesses. With the purple and brown mixture applied, I then applied a layer of pure flat earth. Now, compared to the carapace, the areas that I painted with this paint were much more detailed, which meant that I didn't have quite as much room to achieve these long gradients. As such, I mainly focused on the upper areas in order to mimic how light would fall upon them and leave shadows within the recessed areas. Finally, I finished off the non-carapace areas by mixing together some flat earth and some dark sand. This created a lighter tan color that was the closest to the original High Fleet Kraken scheme, but I only used this as an edge highlight. By using it to paint thin lines across the more prominent edge, I helped to create more depth to the surface than was actually there. This is called volume, and traditionally it refers to creating the illusion of three dimensions on a 2D surface. But for our purposes, as we already have three dimensions, volume simply is used to emphasize these 3D aspects. By using a lighter paint near a darker paint, you simply help to emphasize the distance between the two areas, more so than is actually physically present. At this point, the vast majority of the model had been completed and I just needed to add a little color variation to a few of the areas. I chose to use a pale pink color to stand out against the dark tan and to also create the appearance of stretched skin over the spore sacs. I mixed blood red and some white together, thinned this out as usual and then applied some light layers across those aforementioned areas as well as the tongue and the small ridge sections across the arms and the legs. The final step was to add a little color accent to contrast against the red of the armor, and I did this by using some scorpion green. This extremely bright green was thinned with water before being painted over the lower halves of each of the spore sacs. This was done to create a slightly translucent effect to the skin and to create the appearance that the sacs were filled with a lurid green liquid, which has become visible in areas where the spores are protruding. And with that, the miniature was complete. I could now go ahead and add the base, as well as giving the model a coat of matte varnish to remove some of the glossiness in the surfaces, which left me with this. And once again, here we have the completed Biovore. Now for a Tyranid army, an involved process like this probably isn't the fastest way of tackling your Horde units, but the principles and colors are all easily applicable to your other miniatures. For example, the reds and browns featured in this model were also those that I used when painting my Primus Azrael. So, even if you don't use this guy to paint your own Tyranids, you'll likely be able to find good use for it elsewhere. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this plastic biovore was created as part of a conversion guide. So, if you're interested in how I built it, then I'll include a link to that guide both above and below. And if you like this video, then please do subscribe and leave me a like as well. So the final thing to say is a massive thank you to my supporters. Currently, my top supporters on Patreon are Stuart Smith, Jeremy Kaup, Jake, and Daniel Dowling. So a big thank you to you guys. And if you also support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee, or you just use my affiliates links, then your help is what keeps this channel alive. And it's also what allows me to create my conversions and painting guides like this for you. If you would like to help me out, then you can check out my description for all of the relevant links. And so until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.